morning and welcome to Christ Community Church. I'm George Gasperson. I'm the lead pastor here. If you're here today and happen to be here for the very first time, please know how glad we are that you're here and we really hope that you come back. During the summertime, we're in a series of messages I'm calling uh, Deeper. What we're after is each week talking about a, a, a deeper area of our spiritual life that will help us to become more committed to Jesus Christ and to our faith, more committed to each other and our relationships, and more committed to our church. We began this series of Deeper by talking about forgiveness and the need for letting go of grudges. And then last week, we talked about the topic of restitution, going back and wronging the rights said that backwards, didn't I? Now, that'd be some restitution, wouldn't it? <laughs> hey, you know all that good stuff I said about you in the past? That didn't mean a thing about it. Forget all about it. Please tell me I got it right last week at least. Restitution is going back, taking the wrong things, the bad things that happened, and making them right. So today, um, it's a ticklish topic, one that we don't like to talk about a whole lot. Today we'll talk about the discipline of overcoming impure thoughts. We're going to be talking about our thought life. And if you're a, a parent here with small children that happen to be with you, let me just give you a heads up. This message is rated G. You don't have to worry about anything bad that we're going to say here or that's going to be improper. But we are going to talk about some topics like intimacy, sensual thoughts, and the biblical boundaries of sexual expression. I just wanted to give you a heads up and not cause a, um, a conversation that some not, might not be ready for. So let me start with a question to you. Do you agree with me that we live in a sex-saturated society? There might be one or two that says, well, I'm not so sure. So let me speak to those one or two of you just a minute. I want to take you shopping with me. Let's go on a shopping spree, shall we? Um, you want to buy some jewelry for your wife or someone that you love? Well, here's an advertisement for some jewelry. Couldn't be just a ring or some earrings or a bracelet. A beautiful woman had to come with it. Well, how about, uh, how about some perfume or how about some cologne? innocent enough, right? So let's go shopping for some cologne. Do you think if I wore Calvin Klein's Euphoria, I would kind of happen to look like that? <laughs> it hurts me that you laughed like that. <laughs> All right, let's leave this area. L guys, let's go shopping for a motorcycle. Want to? That's a manly thing to do, right? But you can't find a motorcycle without a beautiful woman on top of it. Now, why do you think about that? All right? Let's get even more basic to get away from the possibility of sensuality. It's summertime. It's in Florida. We sweat. We stink, right? We need some deodorant. So let's go shopping for some deodorant. And you'll find that it's impossible to buy some without cheerleaders hanging all over you. All right? The basic of the basic. I had Raisin Bran this morning for breakfast, and I poured milk on top of my cereal. We all do. We need milk, right? Okay, let's go buy some milk. Oh, no. <laughs> it's got to be something to do with sensuality. And, you know, that's just the printed media. Network television is becoming more and more and more sensual. And what about the movie channels? You can find just about anything available on the movie channels. And then there's the internet. And that takes sensuality to a whole new level. Uh, Margaret turned me on to a, a website that I've found really useful in the past 
few months that deals with this topic. The website is called Fight the New Drug, and I would invite you to check that out sometimes. But I went there this week, and I found some, some statistics that really bugged me about this area of, of sensuality and our thought life and our culture. Here's what I found. In 2016, so much porn was watched on the website Pornhub that all of the data would fill up 194 million USB sticks. In 2017, Pornhub got 20, uh, 28.5 billion visits. That's almost 1,000 hits a second, or 78.1 million visits a day. And in 2016, almost 92 billion videos were watched on Pornhub. That's 12.5 videos for every person on the planet. So we're sitting in church, it's just us, and we're thinking, well, okay, that's the sinful world out there. That's not really us, right? But let me be really honest with you, and let's talk about the elephant in the room. According to Covenant Eyes, which is a, st a statistics company that uh, filters internet pornography sites. 79% of 18 to 30 year old American men view porn at least once a month. That is both inside and outside the church. And unless we think that this is a male problem, 76% of 18 to 30 year old females in America watch porn or view porn at least once a month. To some counselors and spiritual advisors, impure thoughts are not a big deal. These people soothe the consciences of troubled Christians by saying that sexual fantasies are common, they're normal, they're innocent. A few even consider impure thoughts as healthy for your marriage. But the Bible is not in agreement with this viewpoint. It has a name for impure thoughts. The Bible calls it lust. And the Bible refers to lust as sin. And Christians are to get rid of it, along with everything else that trips up our spiritual walk. So let's define the term lust. Lust is dwelling on sexual thoughts which if acted on in real life would clearly be sin. Lust is sensual fantasies about someone that you're not married to. It's sinful sexual thinking nurtured in your mind and dwelled on for the sake of personal pleasure. I want to take a minute to make sure we differentiate between lust and temptation because those two terms aren't the same. Temptation is a thought or an idea introduced in our minds by Satan that invites us to pursue it and end up sinning. Satan may remind you of some sensual memory in your past and asks you to dwell on it. Or he might attempt to seduce you into fantasizing about a particular person. Temptation is a thought that when acted on becomes lust. Do you see the difference? But temptation isn't lust until we entertain it, until we nurture it, until we develop it in our minds. When Jesus was on earth, he was tempted, even in this area of his life, but he never allowed his thoughts to become evil thoughts. He banished these temptations from his mind with a 
definitive, decisive refusal to surrender to them. Temptations turn into lust when we surrender to them and we dwell on them and we nurture them. And let me add one more thought quickly before we move on here. Just as temptation is not lust, neither is dreaming. And people ask me about this sometimes. Dreams are a function of our subconscious mind, and in part, God put them there to help us collate and process the events of our waking experience during the day. Have you ever dreamed that you did something dreadful to somebody, that you hurt them or injured them in some way? I have. I remember waking up, and I was felt awful about myself. It's as if I had really done that, and I was thinking, does God really hold us responsible for something like that? And the answer is no. I, we're not guilty when we dream of things. See, it's really not the dreaming that we need to worry about. It's the daydreaming that brings us down. So let's turn to God's Word. And I want to give you a sampling of Scripture that gives you a flavor of how God thinks about and His instructions to us when it comes to this area of impure thinking. First, I want to begin with Paul in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 10. Paul encourages that we don't have to just fold up and give in whenever we're tempted. Paul writes this, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. I'm going to come back to this verse in a little bit and talk to you a little bit more about resisting temptation. Paul also in Colossians chapter 3 lists a group of, of human behaviors, things that are found in our, our sinful natures that he says we need to just get rid of and put to death. Squarely in the middle of that list is lust. Let me show you. Colossians 3, 5 and 6. Put to death, therefore, Paul says, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. And here's the list. Sexual immorality, impurity, here it is, lust, evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. And it wasn't just Paul that had a comment about lust. Jesus, in his teaching, shocked his listeners by stating that in God's sight, lust is as serious as adultery itself. These are uh, Jesus' words from Matthew chapter 5. Jesus says, you've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now, although Scripture teaches that impure thoughts and lustful thinking is sin, Many, many people just ignore what the Bible says about, about lust. Or they self-interpret Scripture to justify their desires. Or they just accept lust as an inevitable part of life and they give in to it because they feel like they just can't win over it. People treat impure thoughts as trivial they play around with the fire of lust with no fear of being burned. Let me share with you some specific dangers that impure thoughts bring to our life and our relationships with others. Write these down. Here's the first danger. Impure thoughts lead to justifying your sin. Let me explain to you how that happens. Satan will try to tell you not to worry about this way of thinking. Don't worry about impure thoughts because they're private. They're personal. They're innocent. He wants you to dismiss them as ordinary, normal behaviors that all human beings share. 
But here's the problem. As Christ followers, we understand that God has labeled lust to be sin. We get that. And because we believe that as believers, then our conscience will tell us that this is wrong. And if we travel down this road of impure thinking, we will experience the Holy Spirit convicting our lives. But here's what happens. If we don't stop, then our brain tries to find a reason to justify the behavior. See, in our minds, we can't coexist with knowing is something, knowing that something is wrong, but continuing to do it anyway. If, if that tension continues in our mind, then our brain is going to say, well, then I've got to figure out a way how this can be right so I don't continue to get beat up by our conscience. So our conscience will will start to, to make up reasons why lust is normal or not so bad or acceptable. Continuing to act on something you know to be wrong leads to justifying that behavior, regardless of what Scripture says. That's a danger. Here's a second danger. Impure thoughts to lead to leaving, leading a double life. We lead a double life. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then the Holy Spirit, through your conscience, will convict you that this way of thinking is wrong. But because we don't want to always live under conviction, we figure out a workaround. And here's what we do. We partition off that part of our life and we put it in the container. You ever seen one of those seven-day pill holders that got the little divides that just snap down the top? I'm old enough to have one of those now. You got Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday, and they all have little snaps on the top. That's kind of like we have in our lives when we harbor this practice of of impure thoughts we put our thought life in one of those containers and we snap down the lid and we pretend it doesn't exist and we live a double life where we don't open it up when we're with people but when we get in private and get under pressure then we open it up and we lead a double life our world is filled and our churches are filled most likely with Men and women who lead this kind of double life. You probably work and play and socialize with people like this, and you never know it. They seem normal and well adjusted on the outside when you're with them, but in private, they open up this private part of their life and they indulge their their thoughts, and then they emerge racked with guilt and despair because they've disappointed God yet again. It's a horrible way to live. Impure thoughts lead to justifying your sins. Impure thoughts lead to living a double life. And third, impure thoughts become obsessive and addictive. An impure thought life is like an empty well. It promises you a lot of satisfaction, but it leaves you completely unfulfilled. The more you dwell on impure thoughts, the less exciting they'll become over time and the more and more it takes to try to keep being satisfied. If given a foothold, impure thoughts will begin to dominate you and you'll become addicted to the feeling that lust gives you. This sounds pretty bleak, but I want you to know this is not a message about piling on condemnation in an area of your life because now we're going to switch directions and I want you to know that there is victory and there is freedom from an impure thought life. God can set you free and I want to offer you some steps that will lead you out 
of a dark place like impure thoughts. Steps toward freedom. Here's where I believe it all begins. Freedom is found when we first admit the truth. Now, I'm not trying to overstate what I've already said here because we've already pointed out from God's point of view how he feels about an impure thought life. The truth I'm asking you to embrace this morning is the truth of of how damaging an impure thought life is. If you have trouble with lust and impurity, you don't just have a problem, you're in danger. You're in danger of sliding down a slippery slope that leads to disaster in multiple different areas of your life. So many people underestimate the danger that an impure thought life poses They think to themselves, well, this is how everybody thinks. I'm normal. Or else they think, this is a private matter. Nobody knows this. Nobody else is involved. And so it's innocent and it's harmless. The first step in overcoming an impure thought life is acknowledging the seriousness of what's happening and the need for forgiveness and for healing. So you state the obvious, and then you do this. The second step, you starve your sources. Most people have a particular source of temptation that starts them down this road of impure thinking. So what is it for you? Is it a particular TV program? Is it Netflix or HBO or Showtime? How about YouTube videos? Maybe it's a particular kind of book or a magazine. Or maybe for you it's a person, someone who shows you at work or at school a meaningful attention. Your mind is an incredibly complex creation that is a gift from your Heavenly Father. You process more information than any supercomputer on earth. Tons of information and stimuli. And here's what I want you to know about your mind that God gave you. When you expose your mind to any particular stimuli, that stimulus affects what your mind thinks about. And when there is impurity coming in, and that's the stimulus that you're giving your brain, that's what your brain is going to think about. If you expose your mind to the sensual, then you'll have sensual thoughts. If we're going to break free from impure thoughts, we must track down our sources and eliminate them. And here's something else. For most people, There are likely certain times or certain seasons of your life that make you more vulnerable to this kind of temptation. I think I've shared this with you before uh, about myself, but I've come to realize that when I'm extremely tired, when I'm extremely stressed, or when I'm extremely bored, I'm more vulnerable during those times than I am at other times. It's worth investing your time and thought into discovering and realizing exactly where your weak points are. Admit the truth, starve your sources, and here is what I really want you to hear this morning, a third step in finding freedom from this area of our life, fight back. Fight back. It saddens me to see how many Christians consider this battle for impure thoughts is a battle that they can't win. And as a result, they don't even put up a fight. Instead of standing against temptation, they just give up, they give in, 
and they think, well, my only recourse is to find forgiveness once I've fallen. This is not the mindset that God wants us to have because he's supplied us with powerful weapons that are sufficient to make a successful stand against impurity. We fail because we fail to fight. Listen to Paul's description of how well equipped we are to stand up against temptation. This is from 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul writes, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. Man, this is a huge statement. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Did you know that you can command and captivate your thoughts? We have the ability to do that for God's glory. We just finished the study of the book of Ephesians not long ago. Paul detailed in chapter 6 our spiritual armor designed to protect us against Satan's temptations. Paul writes this, Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, we can melt into a puddle and give up. No, so we can stand our ground. And after we've done everything, to stand. Somebody calm me down. I'm trying to preach up here. <laughs> and what I read you earlier from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul reminds us that when we're tempted, falling is not a foregone conclusion. He said, no temptation has overtaken you except what's common to man, and God is faithful. He's not going to beat us down or, or cause us to go through a temptation that completely wipes us out that we cannot stand against. He provides a way out so we can endure. If you don't remember anything else I say this morning, I want you to remember this. Don't give in to temptation without a fight because we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. We have the weapons. We have the armor. We have everything we need to stand when Satan comes against us. My friends, fight for your purity. Fight for it. And then one more step, seek help and accountability in your efforts. All right, I admit it's going to be stupid, but I've made up a riddle for you. You ready? What do secret sins like impurity have in common with a vampire? If you said they suck the life out of you, then you get high marks for creativity. That's not exactly the answer, but nice try. Here's the correct answer. What do secret sins like impurity have to do with a vampire? Well, when you shine a bright light on them, they both lose their power. God's truth is a searing, bright light that not only exposes the wickedness of sin, but takes its power away. When the light of God shines on the dark places of our heart, not only are they exposed, they begin to heal. If you have an issue with impure thoughts, Satan is going to tell you, keep it quiet, keep it private, keep it in the dark, because when it's exposed to light, you begin to be healed. And God has blessed our church with a ministry that has done exactly this. Shine a bright light of God's truth into the dark places of our hearts. The ministry is Celebrate Recovery, who can help you and give you accountability in this area of lust and impurity. 
You know, most of the people who minister in CR, you know why they, they continue to minister? Because they are the very people that have been where some of us are today. There's a dark, walled-off part of our hearts, but God's light has shown into their lives. And you know what? They are walking around in freedom and victory today. And they are in ministry so that they can offer the same to us. Satan's going to tell you not to tell anyone what you're struggling with because you'll be judged because you'll be condemned because people will think well they claim to be a Christian but they have a problem with this in their heart they're just a big fake and a big fraud that's a lie there is victory there is freedom possible this morning for a person who is enslaved with impure thoughts. I can imagine what you must be thinking right about now. Will that man ever shut up and sit down? It's not been fun up here either. But I just happen to think that we don't talk about this enough because lust and impure thoughts are ruining the lives and the marriages and the families of people everywhere, including those in the church. If you are personally struggling with this issue this morning, please don't believe the lie that there are no answers, that there is no victory, that there is no freedom. The point of this message has not been to pile on condemnation. It's to encourage you that you can be free. We sing a song sometimes that says, Who the Son has set free, he is free indeed. And that can be the theme verse of your life this morning. So what do you do about this? Well, here's what I would suggest. I want you to know that, that I and your, pa per, and your pastoral staff are always ready to help you. If you were to call and say, can we have a conversation I just have to admit that sometimes this is an issue in my life. I want you to know that there will be no condemnation. There will be no judgment. What you will hear is, I love you, and I know what this temptation is like. Let's walk this road together. On Friday nights, Celebrate Recovery would love to walk with you during this road. There's a table for see our stuff right out in our mall after the service is over why don't you mosey on past there and you'll probably find one of the CR people out there and just say hey what this is what's this all about H how do I get how do I get connected with this and they'll take it from there listen I don't know about you but I'm done with just a half-hearted Christian life. It's time for God's people to find out and rediscover what holy living means again. And throw off all of this stuff that is just, this is the way the world goes, and so we'll just blend in and we'll just try to just kind of sneak into heaven. No, God wants holy living. He wants a deeper spiritual life because he's got stuff for us in our church to do. And we've got to get ourselves right. This is a great place to start. Let me pray for you and for your family and for us. Can I? My Father, we're, we're frail and we're caught kind of in the middle. We want to be holy, but we have this ball and chain of a, of a carnal life that we're trying to drag around. And so often we... We get caught up in the temptations of life. You know what it's like to be tempted. I just pray 
that you would help us to take this issue seriously. We, we know for sure what you feel about it. We know the dangers. Now I pray that you would give us the courage to deal a death blow to this part of our lives. Give us freedom. Give us victory. You promised, and you've given us everything we need. Now help us to just take that step into freedom. I pray this in your name. Amen. Okay, our prayer team's going to assemble up here for prayer for you or for anyone that you know of. If that's what you need, come down and pray. Our ushers are standing at the back ready to receive your tithes and offerings. Hey, listen, thanks for coming and hanging in here with me. Come back. We'll do it again next week. We are going to be holy people that are pleasing to the Lord and walking in victory. That's my goal for us. God bless you and have a great week.